done something to my shit. All right, folks, uh, it's time to get started with the TLS working group session. So please take your seats. If I could get somebody to close the back door so we can reduce the noise, that would be awesome. All right. So um, here is the uh, note well slide. Uh, this slide is an overview of the policies of the IETF. There are numerous links on here that you can use to look up the policies on everything from IPR uh, to uh, anti-harassment um, and privacy. So please take a look at this. This is important information for you all. Um, we also have a, another slide here on the note really well which is just an emphasis that we should all treat each other with uh, respect and keep things professional in our discussions in these meetings. And that will help us, uh, you know, work more efficiently and end up with better work products. Um, everybody, please join the, uh, on the meeting with the on-site tool so that we get an accurate representation of the number of people attending this meeting in person and also so that we can, uh, you can join the queue. This is how we'll manage the queue is through the on-site tool. So if you wanna ask questions or participate at the microphone, please do that. Uh, next slide. Agenda, okay, so uh, we have a scribe. Um, Sean will go through some of the ID status in a minute. Um, we will probably try to rearrange some of these things, well, I guess, to uh, move the uh, hybrid and uh, ML cam things a little bit earlier because some participants have to leave early for that uh, discussion. So we'll try to move those a little bit earlier if that's okay with folks. Um, and then we have uh, some additional uh, topics on TLS Frozen, SSS key, SSL key log for ECH, extended key update, and trust expressions will close out our meeting. Um, any questions on the agenda? All right, I'll turn it over to Sean. Hi, so I'm just gonna blow through these slides really quick uh, because I sent this to, the, to, to uh, the actual list already. So you normally go through the working group status. Uh, I don't wanna waste time because we've got a pretty tight agenda, but we are gonna use the stopwatch today to make sure we uh, stay on point so that we get to everything. But uh, as you can see, I went through each one of the drafts and its status. There's a couple things that are stuck on various things and some things are moving forward. Some people have told me they're gonna reinvigorate things. So that's great. So please read the email. Now we're gonna go to, which one do you wanna do? What do you wanna do hybrid key exchange first or ML for chem? Hybrid, ML chem first? All right, cool. Let's do that one first. All right, thank you, Dirk. Hello, uh, this is re-upping something I introduced, I don't know, last meeting, the meeting before, I don't, I don't remember. Um, this is just a, just a document to lay out how to do key agreement in TLS 1.3 with just MLChem, the future FIPS draft that's supposed to drop any day now or next month. Um, this is very, very similar, but not the same as the hybrid key agreement thing that we are very happy with and we're, I'm gonna talk about next. Um, we need a document and not just a code point and not just a, a, a IANA allocation because we don't have any other documents that say how to do chem-based key agreement in TLS, not hybrid, not combining with anything else. You can infer from hybrid design a lot of the things I wrote down in this document, but they aren't written down. So I wrote them down and that's all it is. Um, I am not asking for recommended. I'm not asking for mandatory to implement. I'm not asking for any of those things. I just want to write it down because I would like to be able to do it in my TLS applications. And I know there are other people out in the world that would like to be able to do it, especially MLChem 1024. So that's it. Uh, this is in the draft. It's just literally these two ways to do it. 
Some people have been like, well, what about 512 to just round it all out? I'm not opposed to 512, but I know that most people who are not needing to comply with uh, CNSA 2.0 or any of that stuff seem to like 768. 768 seems to give you small enough but conservative enough parameters. I'm not opposed to 512, but it's not in there right now. Next, please. And then this is just kind of how you do it. You're going to do, uh, you're going to generate an ephemeral key pair. You do, uh, you do decaps. You do an encaps to your key pair. You send them, and then your server will reply or with it with a. Uh, sorry, it was the other way around. You generate your ephemeral key pair. You send it to the server. The server does an encaps to the key pair and sends the ciphertext back over. And that's how you do it. Next, please. And then the shared secret that comes out both sides of of ML Chem, you shove it into your TLS 1.3 key schedule the same way that you're doing it in the same place for hybrid design, the same place that you put it for ephemeral Diffie-Hellman, elliptic curve ephemeral Diffie-Hellman, same, same. Next. Okay, I already said this, why can't you just do a code point? Because we don't have another document that tells you how to do this thing. This is trying to fill that void. Should this be recommended? Should this be a mandatory implement? I don't think so, not at this juncture. Maybe in like a decade, we can, we all feel that way. I don't, I don't care. I just want to be able to do it officially with TLS 1.3. What about we're doing chems? What about PQ signatures? Not in scope, not now. We don't know how to do it right now. We have a lot of things to talk about with PQ signatures. This is not about PQ signatures. This is just, we have a nice thing. We already, we're already doing it in a hybrid way. I just want to do it by itself. It's just drawing the rest of the owl as it were. Isn't this too early? I don't think it's too early at all. <laughs> People are chomping at the bit for these documents, the FIPS documents to come out years ago at this time. I, it, we've already deployed hybrid in Chrome, uh, Envoy, Cloudflare. It's already getting negotiated in a lot of places. This is doing less cryptography, simpler cryptography in a way, um, and drawing the rest of the owl. I do not think it's too early. Uh, why not just use hybrid? Because what if you don't want to? And what if you are totally comfortable going directly to ML Chem, do not pass go, do not collect $200? Why not be able to? And there are parties that will be required to do only ML Chem 1024, and I want to do it. Why can't they do it too? Uh, I don't trust the crypto. <laughs> whatever. Uh, read that slide and whatever. Okay. Question. There's already a long queue, so Honest, you're up first. <laughs> All right, we got nine minutes, ten minutes. Uh, make it quick. Yeah, I like this approach because it's easy to integrate and sort of like feels almost a natural extension because we've seen other proposals uh, in the past which were sort of radical modifications to the way how DLS worked, and that scared me a little bit because of all the work that it requires to sort of move there. So um, I'm in favor of this. Yov? Um, yeah, uh, can we go back to the FAQ slide? Which one? Oh, FAQ. Yeah, that's one. Sure. Okay, so I'd like to push back a bit some of them. Uh, you said that you can't just get a code point. Yes, you can. The uh, policy is specification required. The specification does not need to be an RFC. You can totally get it just with a draft or a document from some other place. That said, the fact that you can does not mean that you should. I think the right thing is to adopt it here and have it as a working group document. Um, so mandatory to implement, I agree that's not, uh, is it too early? No, it's not in the document. Even if uh, your document is uh, uh, destined to be informational, I think that's wrong. I think it should be proposed standard. It, proposed standard is just that, it's proposed. It doesn't mean that everybody has to, it doesn't mean that it becomes the standard that everybody adopts. It could be a proposed standard. Definitely for informational, it's not too early. And if somebody doesn't like it, well, it's a proposed standard. They don't have to implement it. You're not forcing anybody. There's no protocol police. So yeah, that's it. Thanks. Pretty much agree. All right. Kyle? Kyle Neckritz. Uh, I support this. I think I'm echoing a lot of the same points. Um, if we don't do this now, then I think it becomes kind of unclear what exactly we're waiting for. Um, just on the 512 code point, um, I would like to see that as well, just because that can make a significant difference if you're trying to fit um, things into one packet when you mm -hmm. don't have that much room left. Right, yep. 
yeah, just a me too to that. I, I, I support this. If people want it. Uh, I want it. But I'd also like to see 512 just to round things out. Thank you. Cool. Paul? Paul Vautas, sort of AD. Um, <laughs> so this combines a particular chem with the description of how to generically do chems, right? Yes, but it is being particular about of these supported groups. This is how you sure, put sure. it in the thing. So, yes. so let's say instead of you, we now had someone from the Klingon Empire standing here doing, <laughs> saying, this is how we should generally do chems. This is the one, this is the one we propose here as an example. We might not be as happy about that, right? Mm. So um, come to my talk on SAC <laughs> tomorrow <laughs> when we talk about crypto and ITF. Um, personally, I would like to see that split up where we're, if, we, if it is possible to say like, this is how you should use chems without any specific chem, then I could see that, that much more getting an RFC than if we tie it to one specific one, because that's exactly what the security ideas are trying to avoid, where we seem to be favoring okay. one um, a cipher over another. What if I do both and I split it up and then I immediately re-edit re my current document to be like, this is an instance of that, because that's what we're doing with hybrid design. Then maybe I will tell you, you can get a code point, but on RFC for your chem. <laughs> yeah. Chris Wood, um, I'm supportive of this as well. Um, I wanted to comment on the last uh, item in the back here, which is uh, on whether or not we have confidence in the design or the algorithm itself. I think we do, um, but I would caution against having the same level of confidence in the implementations of MLChem that exist. Um, uh, so I think this needs to happen at some point, but jumping to MLChem only right now when we're not quite sure we have the same like production-ready implementations of the cryptographic algorithms uh, might be a bit premature. Um, so. Otherwise, yeah, full steam ahead. So I would like to ask Paul something. So is it possible that we could, because uh, no one's speaking against not doing this. So this seems like we're clearly on a path for working group adoption. Can we adopt it? And then if you're like, no, you got to remove the code points, we remove the code points. My question is, because I mean, the idea is that people are like, this document apparently is going to drop anytime now. And then people are going to be banging down the doors for where, if I want to do this, how do I do this? You can't do this. Can't, can't you really not split it into documents? Well, we could, but then the question is, can we just, <clears throat> you know. And you we, can definitely adopt one of them. And the other one, we, we can, we'll have the discussion on Thursday and Friday about, about okay. specific algorithms. So I know, that, I know that you are motivated. Can you split it? And then we can, so if the plan is really, if you're directing us, that the thing, the clearest thing to do is if we split the code points out and we just have the mechanism, and specify how to do it. The draft is really friggin' short. Yep. And then we can do a working group call for adoption, and that sounds like a plan. Does anybody think that that is a bad idea? I have qualms because yes. some chems are <clears throat> much bigger and have other security concerns, and someone is nodding vigorously, and I think we all know some of the things we're, we're thinking of. ML chem is easy mode of all the chems that are currently under discussion as things we might deploy in practice. I'm thinking of classic Michaelis. They're there are things that I would, I would write a lot more words if I know a document is gonna be possibly deployed with classic Michaelese than I am with MLChem. So if we start to split it up and we start to be like, well, what about these considerations for all these chems? We have to add more stuff to a document, which means it's not gonna land as something that people can trust and start implementing the way they've been doing hybrid design a lot longer from now. So I, I agree in principle, but I am very, it's going to gum up the works to what end? John? Yeah, hi, it's John Gray from Entrust. I think I was thinking about the same thing because you're, this document is about ML chem specifically, but having, you know, you have the generic mechanism or a mechanism that could be more generic in the document, right? I guess if that could be separated out um, and then you could have other documents that make use of that, then it could be really helpful because we know more chems are coming, right? There's the whole round four um, and there's gonna be more and having a way to do that will be very helpful. <clears throat> I, I have a, a counter argument to what I just said. I can make it super restrictive. I can be like, everything needs to be hashed in. Your big ass public keys, your big ass ciphertext, everything is going in the TLS 1.3 key schedule because it's all in your client holos and your server holos and all that. And it, you do not get exceptions if you have 
a, a chem that is based on a different security problem that results in big ciphertext or big public keys or, or big in, you know, uh, compute times or anything like that. I can write that down really easily. And it might make some people unhappy, yeah. but it'll yeah. be secure. All right, we're going to need okay. to lock the queue because we got two minutes and 40 seconds left and there's four people. So am I understanding right that the proposed split here is to like define how chems work generally and then instantiate it with ML chem? Two documents, yes. I'll basically take the super general stuff that I already have and just be like, you can use this for any chem that has Yes, that a has bunch of problems. Yes, that, that's the problem. Like is like enumerating that. So like I sure. think if we know if we know how to do it with ML chem, like let's just do that. If we can abstract that later and follow that, if, if there's demand for any other cipher suites of the same shape later, if like we know there's gonna be demand for this, like let's do it. We know how to do it. And if there's demand for other similar stuff later, then we can abstract, like solve the problem and then abstract. Uh, I, I was very, very brief. Um, just very brief, I completely agree with that. I think one document that, that describes MLCAM is the better solution for all the things you said. I just wanted to put it on the record that I agree with you. So, so Paul out is AD, now with my AD head on. Um, <laughs> So why do you need an RFC then? Why not just a code point? Because we don't have a document that says how to do it just with any chem, let alone ML chem. We have hybrid, but inferring what you do if it's not hybrid is left up to the reader. So this is literally just finishing the other side of hybrid design for just a chem. Okay, so I, I guess to me that still feels like that that your document is doing two things, and that could be in two different documents. But um, we can talk this up more of list. Yeah. Uh, Dennis Jackson, um, I think you know doing the safe thing for the combiner and and keeping it scoped to MLCAM is like the smart call. Just because people copy each other's homework all the time without really understanding what they're doing, and you know a lot has been said about combiners, and I I think we probably all want to try and solve that issue as soon as possible. But if we need this sooner, then doing the simplest, safest thing seems like a great way forward. TLS 1.3 is blessed to not have to worry about as much stuff as other settings for both key, uh, for key agreement or hybrid key agreement. I don't oppose a general chem or TLS 1.3 key agreement thing because we don't have to worry about the stuff like binding properties as much because everything is going in the TLS 1.3 key schedule. We are, we are in the ponies and rainbows land, but it does add more stuff to the bureaucracy mill. This document has to concern all these things and then this one has to reference it. So that's kind of where I'm thinking. Cool, yeah, thank you. I'm gonna talk some more. <laughs> Hybrid key exchange for TLS 1.3. Um, this is not my document, I contributed to it. This is Douglas Stabila and a couple of other people. Um, this is how you take elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman and a chem, the only two instances so far have been using ML chem, previously called Kyber, or specifically Kyber 768, um, and combining them into TLS 1.3 key exchange to do your shared secret at the very end. We have two instances that point to this document. Hybrid design is the general way, and then the, the two documents, X25519 Kyber and SecP256 and Kyber, are two different drafts and they define their code points. So I think we're just talking about moving hybrid design forward. Um, the 25519 Kyber one has been implemented and deployed for several weeks now. I think we're getting 20% of fresh negotiations between those two uh, ends are uh, negotiating and using uh, hybrid post-quantum TLS 1.3 in the wild. So yay. Um, I don't have any numbers on the SecP 256 one. Uh, I think the only thing to say here is that the generic one, hybrid design, is on version 10. It's been tested. It looks good. I think we don't have any significant concerns with it. Um, and so I think, and just under no, underlining that it will move on, and then any new code points, any new hybrid key agreements will have their own individual documents. It's basically exactly what Paul just said. Um, so we have two, if there are any further, we just create a new one and we ask for a code point and 
there we go. So I think hybrid design can move on and we can tr probably try our last call so, soon. So to be clear, yeah. there's no MTI in the hybrid design. No, no, no. Document. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the other thing. No, okay. man, no MTI and no recommended either. That is our plan going forward unless somebody gets to the microphone and starts screaming pretty quickly. Yeah. No, no recommendations or anything like that. Just we can use it. So whoever taking minutes, please make sure that that's <laughs> down. <laughs> that's it. Thank you. Um, All right. That's it. I think it's just questions. Yep. Uh, now I think we stop and we go back to me. Oh. All right. So do you mind walking here? Thank you. Uh, hello. Hello. I'm Sean Turner. I'm channeling my Ecker. Actually, I don't know. Um, I do speak quickly, but not as quickly as him. And he'd probably tell me he didn't want to do these slides anyway. So next. <laughs> So last time, if you remember, we were all worried about, I was all worried about trying to make sure we got the errata um, that was out on 8446 uh, addressed. We did that. Uh, many thanks to Ben Smith. He went through his 25 or so errata and figured out which ones still applied in the latest version and then it ended up a couple. But we ended up merging things. If you noted on the list that it consensus calls on each one of these things and we moved them all forward. Thanks to David Benjamin as well for providing uh, some unifying client cert and server cert selection text and uh, also forbidding the sender um, from sending duplicate support reports. So we have a couple of queued PRs. Now there are two. One is very straightforward. Uh, seems like everybody was good. There's one minor point, I guess, the very last part of the change. Martin said it would be better if you kind of clean the text up. And Ecker said, sure. Um, I'll get to that when I get done with this thing that he's off doing this week. Now the next one is about making 25519 a mandatory to implement. Everyone take a deep breath. We're going to the next slide. Let's keep it professional. Whenever we talk about curves, people seem to lose their minds and it ends up being a dumpster fire. We are not going to do that today. Um, keep that in mind. OK, next. So the PR as written uh, was, um, as discussed on the list, was to make X25 I and 19 another mandatory to implement algorithm. Now, what I'll say is that on the list, it was it's faster, it's better, it's still it's deployed now. Um, I care about FIPS compliance. I don't care about FIPS compliant. Um, don't bother. I mean, those were basically all the arguments on the list or the discussions for one point or another. But the point that I first remember seeing brought up, I think it was by um, Andre Popoff, was like, this isn't even appropriate for this particular mm -hmm. um, document because we're just doing clarifications. So I think that's actually the question we have to ask, answer first. So um, I would like to move to the next slide. I proposed hums, but I actually think it's, we're gonna do a show of hands tool. And so the first one is, is it even appropriate to make this change to this ID, which was supposed to be um, just for clarifications? And we'll do a second one, if and only if hum one is a why, which is to actually make this change. Because in talking with you, a lot of you in the hallway, I mean, I put that PSA slide in all freaked out that like we were gonna have a large knife fight here. And uh, everyone was like, Eh. That was kind of the response I get. I'm like, well, wait, have we like blown steam off on this particular topic? So I've been very happy that the, the five or six of you that I talked to were like, nah, it probably won't be that bad. So Hannes, do you want to hop up there first? Is this a mandatory to implement for clients and servers? Both? Uh, so yes. OK. Um, well, although I'm I'm not working in IoT anymore, but in general, like uh, having mandatory to implement for different algorithms, specifically when uh, you have hardware support for one and not hardware support for the other, is kind of uh, not great. Right. Well, again, so that uh, that whole discussion may be moot if we don't even make this change. So that's why I want okay. to do the first change. Okay. Is whether that's... right? Because yeah, we could we could dive off into speed and support and all the kinds of you know things. But at the end of the day, it's whether or not we're even going to make this. Have you made a yeah, to make well to make a change to you know, whatever bad English. So hopefully that was clear enough. Yeah. And there's 110 of you in here. That's what I love about writing hums early. Everyone nitpicks your English because I screw them up often. <laughs> All 
All right, folks, I think we're trending towards not making this change. So um, I think if we're gonna end up making mandatory and implement algorithm changes later, it'll be done in you know, some other version possibly. But I think at this point, this discussion is dead. Um, I guess we will need to confirm this on the list, um, but unless uh, we get a whole lot of support on the list for making the change, we'll go ahead and close this PR after a little while. And I yield five minutes and 45 seconds to the next person. Sorry, uh, we're not, Meet Echo is not allowing me to kill the slides. Oh, shit. Okay, let me try this again. Yes. All right, now it's working. All right, oh, Deirdre's yeah. back up. All right, this is an, an update on the formal analysis triage panel that I suggested, and I think everyone was on board with, uh, I think at the last meeting, the one that was I was online for. Uh, next. Um, we would, and yeah, we initially called this a formal analysis triage panel, and then someone realized that if we just called it the formal analysis triage team, we could call it the FAT. So now it's called the FAT. I'm, I'm making t-shirts. You know, complimentary, <laughs> not derogatory, complimentary. Uh, so this is reference to like the first kickoff that we, uh, well, the why we wanted to do this. This was the, uh, the call for uh, 8773 this, where during the, the uh, last call, there was a lot of noise about, we would really love to have updated formal, uh, some formal analysis, not just updated, some formal analysis on this change to TLS 1.3. Um, and this is basically where uh, instead of only pre-shared key or certificate-based auth, you can do both. Um, this has been noted to be not ever included in the modeling, uh, symbolic, computational, otherwise, of TLS 1.3 or other, you know, broader models of TLS, uh, period. So when I, you know, mentioned this in passing to, you know, a person who has tons of experience doing this sort of thing, they're just sort of like, oh yeah, we never thought about that. We always assumed that these things were completely disjoint. Um, so basically this kind of spurred like, well, how do we kind of include a consensus-based process to get feedback from people like that earlier in the process when we make changes to TLS 1.3, not all the things that come through this working group, but specifically 1.3 because it, and specifically specific areas like the confidentiality authentication properties that have been well kind of established uh, of TLS 1.3 by prior formal analysis proofs uh, Tamarin models, ProVerif models, com uh, you know, uh, lots and lots of modeling tools. Uh, next. And next. Um, so the proposed mechanism relied on existing consensus-based uh, mechanisms that we have in the, in the group, which is basically we have a rotating group of invited experts who have experience modeling doing security proofs uh, of TLS 1.3 and other you know, secure channel uh, mechanisms uh, during adoption calls, during last calls to give their you know, knee-jerk reaction to a proposed document, a proposed document to come for adoption, proposed document to go to last call, both because sometimes you adopt something and then you go to last call and some diffs have happened in between that you just kind of want to, you know, double check that anything that you have done is still valid. Um, and then if they recommend that update analysis would happen, you know, get their guidance on how long it would take, how much work it would take, do they know somebody that can help you, you know, complete the work, that sort of thing. Okay, next. Uh, yeah. Next, just more of the same. Um, so during all of these you know, requests for feedback from the FAT, we literally send them an email 
with a link to the, the draft of the document say, what do you think? Do you think this invalidates prior analysis? Do you think this requires updated analysis? Of what kind? What security properties do you think specifically need to be analyzed or established or revisited? Um, and then collect all of their response emails and bring them back to the TLS working group mailing list. That's basically it. Um, the, the panel membership can be refreshed on a regular basis and every time that we send out for feedback from the, the triage team, we tell you who's on the triage team so you know and they can then continue to participate on the working group mailing list or not because some of them are not IETF people and we do not want to limit uh, the feedback we can get to just IETF people who can be on the IETF mailing lists. Um, we have at least one person who's already said that they might be interested in additionally helping out with this sort of work. Next. So what kind of formal analysis? We, there's a lot of talk about Tamarin because there's been a lot of Tamarin analysis of TLS 1.3. Not just Tamarin. Um, our panel can suggest specific approaches that might be brand new, that might be building on existing work, that might just be pen and paper proofs. That has extremely uh, important value too. Computational models for different components of TLS. Um, any, any and all of the above. The goal of all of this is to take this golden goose that we have of high degrees of cryptographic assurance of TLS 1.3 and maintain it over time as the protocol continues to evolve and change because it's a living protocol that lives and is used in the world and implemented by people and deployed by people and comes into conflict with, I want to do certificates and pre-shared keys, not just either or, for very good reasons. So we need to do work to keep that up. So the first thing we tried to do was doing it 8773BIS. This is hard mode because it had already gone through an adoption call. It had already gone through a, a, a working group last call. People already said and vaguely tried to go get formal analysis of it and did not succeed. Now what? <laughs> so um, this is what it is, uh, the actual document, a sensitivity bis. Um, so we went to the, the triage team. They got uh, a bunch of uh, feedback from us and we sent it to the list. They requested and recommended more clarity in the actual document, 8773BIS, on the intended security goals, like that's just updating the document itself, and further analysis, security analysis, to check especially the authentication properties, and that symbolic analysis tools would be suitable, such as Proverif, Tamarin, and things like that. There are maybe some others that are slightly less popular. The document hasn't had any changes yet since this came down. I think we heard that the author and Usama, Mohammed Musama, are collaborating on this work. If we have any updates, we'd love to hear it. Um, and we have not made any further consensus calls regarding any of this work yet, considering that this is like hard mode, we kind of just have to like do one eventually to get the consensus of the working group that one, yes, we want to do this and either block or whatever on getting this feedback or not. I think that's it. There are a couple more slides, but Russ, since we're talking about yeah. your draft and Osama, you want to get in line too, we can do that. Yeah, I object to this characterization of where we are. Um, so I completely agree with the goal uh, of the formal methods to maintain the uh, protocol, but you posted a summary of the um, uh, FAT result Questions were asked, no answers have been submitted, and no consensus call by the chairs has been posted. Mm -hmm. Which questions? They're on the list. It was, it was a day or two later after you posted the summary. There's been no reply to that message. Osama? Sama to you, Dresden. So I'm also a bit surprised by this because Russ and I had a discussion around this and we were still waiting for the reply from the chairs to give us a consensus call whether we need to proceed with this or not or what the working group has decided about this. And the second thing is that uh, uh, I do have some concerns around the process overall, how it happens. 
Like I didn't like that. Even with the conferences, for instance, um, you see, like I get to see that this is the review coming from reviewer number one. I didn't. Uh, I might not know who it is, but at least I know reviewer number one has commented this, this, this thing. Reviewer number two is completely isolated from that. Reviewer number two said X, Y, Z. Reviewer number three says A, B, C. But I know that X, Y, Z was coming from reviewer number two. He has one mentality that I can kind of follow around. Reviewer number three was saying something else. I could follow that around. Uh, but in this case, the summary was not really helpful in the sense that it was isolating. It was combining all the things together. And I couldn't really see which is coming from where and how the two are how everything is together, uh, uh, merged together. So what I'm trying to say is that I lack, I, I, I have concerns around the transparency in the process. I would have liked to see that everything could happen transparently on the mailing list. And I could see wh what is coming from where, or at least the minimal thing is that I could see that separately isolated that, let's say, even if they want to be anonymous, ABC, so review number one is saying this thing, all, all the questions answers review number two is saying let's say one number whatever the, all the questions to the answer all the answers to the questions that he gave should be at least isolated so that I can see that what exactly is uh, overall the, the going on so so and I would have liked let's say to be as a volunteer for doing that formal analysis I would have liked to be a part of the process itself so I would really appreciate if the process could be more transparent and be done on the formal uh, on the on the mailing list rather than being done outside the mailing list? Uh, that's really good feedback. Um, definitely we can make, one of the goals is to make it very much like academic review. And you're right that in more of an academic review setting, you don't know who reviewer number one is or review number two is, but their answers are all collated as from reviewer number one or re reviewer number two or whatever. We can definitely try to do that in, in, the, in the future. I think that's very valuable. Um, the second part is basically, we do want it to be quite transparent in that like I want to be part of this process that's why we get their feedback on a snapshot of one document and then bring it all to the list that was all the words from our review team we do want to keep it anonymous so that they aren't just out on blast in the IETF or on the public internet because a lot of them are not IETFers they are academics they are not on mailing lists on the public internet we want to get their you know professional uh, you know, uh, expert feedback, but we don't, we want to keep it, you know, very specific. We want your feedback on this document. We want your professional opinion and recommendation and bring that to the list. And then everything from there on is what does the working group think? Please discuss, please let me, let us know what you want to do with this professional review and feedback of this document. Britta Hale. I second the request for having a more transparency in the process. I agree that a lot of reviewers on these probably won't want their names out there in the same way that we do on working lists. But normally in a review process, there is a committee list of people who might be asked for review. Oh, they're and all it's... up there when we first make the call. Okay, all their so... names are listed, the entire list, not the might be's, like these is, this is the entire list. Okay, so first of all is the transparency of who might be asked. And then second, of what type of analysis might be asked about. You mentioned several different types of tools and methods, but each of these show very different things. A formal methods analysis is not the same as a computational proof. Mm -hmm. And those two approaches are going to, we've had a long history in TLS of different types of analyses done, and it's good to have a cohesive view versus if we ask a few handful of people, and um, what do they say? Mm -hmm. And also I think there's something to be said about reviewers being willing to come forward and whether or not uh, that's being transferred to the list. So I can speak personally that I was one of those people who was asked to do the analysis on this particular draft. And I corresponded to several other people who are experts in the area who've done stuff with PSK, injects with TLS before. And we all came to agreement about whether or not this analysis would actually even be worth it. And What do you mean by that, worth it? Because the prior analysis actually would extrapolate directly to this. So there wasn't going to be enough of a lift of a change to warrant more analysis. We would love to hear that and specific references on the list about this document because we weren't able to get anything of prior work basically to say we think this is fine because of cited reason. Right, so that's sort of transparency that's lacking, mm -hmm. exactly. So when you ask a reviewer, you, there should be a transparency of whether they're willing to come to the list or to interpret that information too, otherwise we're having a very black box method. Mm -hmm. 
uh, Dennis Jackson. So um, I'm one of the people on the review panel and also like without disclosing anything about how it worked, I think like I, I generally agree with the comments that transparency would be helpful. And I think the best, one of the best ways that we can achieve that is to like cleanly separate these two bits. This was very much a formal analysis triage, which was, you know, a first glance of like looking at the, the draft that we see in front of us, what do we think we would need to see to feel more comfortable about it? And I think that is like, it's only the first part of the conversation. Yeah. And a, a clean way to separate that is to, to be clear that the, the analysis panel, you know, give their feedback, but what the working group decides to do with that and how that relates to any other IETF process shouldn't really be within the, the remit of the analysis panel because we're formal verification experts. We're not necessarily uh, IETF experts, so some of us do both. Um, and that like would lend itself to these kind of follow-on conversations where the folks that are experts in a particular more narrow area can say, oh yeah, well, using this result here, we can actually do this in three sentences. There's no paper in it, but we can clean that up to the IETF satisfaction. And that's, that's really nice. And yeah, I, the second thing is that I don't think like there's only going to be like a small number of people on the panel to make any forward progress. And that also means that anonymous comments probably won't work super effectively. Mm. So I think, you know, in general, transparency is probably the way forward, like a, a public mailing list where people can also potentially interact and discuss. And then, but trying to make it very clear, it's not about IETF questions. And the folks there aren't gonna know the distinction between a proposed standard versus experimental versus informational. They're not gonna know what working group last call means. They're just there to look at a document and say, I have these security concerns or I don't have any security concerns. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a way we can like cleanly factor that. Thank you. Usama, should I go first? Okay. So, so I would completely agree with what she said. So uh, that's one of the things I was also expecting that whether ProVerif is good to go, whether we need symbolic analysis, whether we need computational analysis, what exactly do we need? So that was also one of the things which was really unclear. And if, if, if we have that kind of a panel, so one thing that I would expect as an outcome is, is exactly that, that, okay, at least symbolic analysis is required or computational analysis is required, what exactly is required. So I had an offline discussion with one of the panelists and the outcome was that it's not even clear that whether the panel did not even decide whether symbolic analysis will be good or whether computational analysis will be good. They left it over to the working group to decide that. Yes. So that should be, at least when we have the, so, so when we call them experts, so at least the one of the outcomes from their opinion, at least they should decide that whether, this is the high level boundary, the topmost boundary that we can have between the formal analysis, either uh, let's say symbolic or computational. So at least they can recommend if not decide that, okay, so we would like symbolic kind of analysis. I was a bit surprised to hear from him that they didn't even discuss whether symbolic was required or whether computation was required. The only thing that was discussed was something is required. What that something is to start with is also like something that uh, someone who is volunteering is also waiting for that. Okay, so, and I, I think the whole process is now in a loop that the chairs are waiting for someone and we are waiting for the chairs to respond. So mm -hmm. I would like more um, procedural thing to be added to the process so that we can, we can be more clear, we can do, uh, we can move forward faster. That's kind of why I was uh, pointing at we were doing it hard mode, because if we had to bring this into this feedback, triage feedback, not this is required or not from this panel, because that was always part of the conceit. This is just a first look gut check triage and take this feedback into either an adoption call or a, a working group last call there would already be kind of discussion happening on the working group, not just, well, a panel of experts said, we think it needs this, but this is not our, it needs this, it must have this, or else it's not achieving some specific goal. Uh, we did not make a consensus call yet. We probably need to do that because we are doing this outside of the plan, I guess. Um, I think that's part of it. The, to what Dennis was saying, I think having two different settings, the working group setting, where it's about documents and procedures and, and consensus calls and stuff like that, and then maybe another forum to, that we host to discuss security properties and changes to TLS 1.3, to try to further on beyond a triage analysis to 
an actual recommendation of this needs a symbolic verification of a property or not, or no, we need a computational proof of, I don't know, in CCA or indistinguishability or something like that. That discussion can happen there and maybe that will improve the transparency that people uh, seem to desire. So we can change a couple of things. All right, Rich, unless, Paul, unless you're throwing your AD card down. <clears throat> Yeah, hi, Rich Sauls. Um, I can post a link to questions I asked that didn't got no response if you need them in the chat. But at any rate, the, the, uh, one of the slides said this is modeled after academic review of papers. And I think that's, this, that's not what this is, right? There's not a paper and someone, an anonymous reviewer who might be conflicted or different or c submitting a competing paper is you know helping to make a go no go decision on a conference as to whether or not something should be presented this is more like collaborative research so i think the model is wrong second you, you just said several sentences about triage and again that also to me uh, makes it pretty clear that the model is wrong they're not deciding anything they're just saying whether or not something else should be done and that's an individual opinion uh, if people aren't willing to attach their name to that, no. We had, uh, I just don't think it's worth listening to them, but frankly, but I'm kind of obnoxious that way. Um, we've had much, many interactions with uh, cryptographers for TLS 1.3. We had a whole public workshop on whether or not it was ready, right? And we encouraged the academic community to participate. The Tron workshop apparently went pretty well. Uh, Hugo Krauts came to many of our interim meetings, and we've had other formal analysis, actual analysis of various parts of TLS 1.3, and none of that was anonymous, and none of that was blocked by who the participants are or this barrier that's implied. I think the thing, overall, the whole concept of that really goes against the spirit of the IETF. So I think this needs to be brought back down to the base thing and reconstructed more like the open IETF processes. Thank you. Paul about AD. Um, I, I have similar comments. Like, it is unclear if the FAT operates under the node dwell of the IETF and where all those rules and, and uh, regulations that we set for our community apply. And so, if if within the IETF we are sort of putting a a blocking a blocking process into place that Stop relies blocking. that it's relies on things outside of the IETF, then uh, then that's the wrong process, right? Um, there might, there might be IPR issues because these people didn't operate on a node well and we're not aware of things. So I think we should really look at how we can sort of fold this into proper IETF process. And, and, and sorry, and it could be that we're just getting external advice from outside the IETF, which is fine too, but then we cannot make it binding in our process within the IETF. Never, never binding, bringing feedback for the working group to discuss as part of their own consensus mechanism. <laughs> I liked what Rich said on uh, anonymity. I think it's uh, it's probably the wrong model here. Uh, when I when I reached out as a as a chair of OAS to uh, the research community to do analysis of uh, OAS, uh, nobody said that they want to be anonymous. Uh, in, on the contrary, they wanted to be evolved. Uh, they are now actually part of our community uh, and proposing uh, solutions. So. Um, having people to subscribe to the DLS mailing is specifically if they want to provide feedback and discuss it and explain what they mean. I think that's that's quite important. They don't have to subscribe to the IETF mailing list, but and uh, but at least to the DLS uh, mailing list that would be extremely helpful. They don't have to read all the emails. Um, so so I think um, a little bit of fine tuning would be appropriate here. Okay, Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan Hoyland, Cloudflare. Uh, not a member of the uh, formal analysis triage team, um, but somebody who did one of the formal analyses of Tamarin in Tamarin of TLS 1.3, um, specifically to 8773biz. Um, the authentication properties that we prove no longer holds onto this change. So if we think that the formal analysis of TLS 1.3 was important, then I think this does have to be blocking but i don't think it's a huge lift to actually redo those proofs um but it's just a lot of busy work because we'd have to rewrite all of the proofs because it changes the key schedule which was the first step of our proof 
So it, it's a lot of work for a very small change. Um, so if there's a lot of desire for it, then maybe we can get someone to do it. But I, I will say that it does break our current proofs. All right, Dennis. I'll try and be very quick. I think this is the, the, the core of the problem. We have people that are willing to volunteer their time to do security research, but don't want to do IETF politics. So I think as long as they're only you know, asked questions about the security of things, they're more than happy to give an opinion. But when that becomes pressure, that's really tricky. So if we can give people a transparent, safe space to provide those opinions in, and then let the working group figure out the IETF side of things, like the authors can, in that sense, like the authors can always come and make a case. Like we've given this feedback, but for what we need it for and when we need it, we'd like to do this instead. And it can be a more work, that, that is a working group discussion. And the actual just, the people that are doing the security analysis have this opinion is then something that is like input to that. I think that would, would probably resolve a lot of these concerns. I definitely agree. I note that a uh, transparent open process where people can avoid politics seems the opposite of what I would think a person who does not want to be harassed on the internet to do work for free would want. Um, we've had at least one person run away from this political process because they were getting dragged in to fights on the internet after being asked for their volunteered professional expert opinion out of the goodness of their hearts to help TLS 1.3 because they were just asked. And they're just like, if this is how it's gonna be, like, screw this, I'll just not participate. So I very much understand the desires and want to segment the working group kind of procedural mechanisms and the uh, security open discussion of like what we need for analysis for certain properties of TLS given changes. But I am very aware of maybe saying modeled on an academic process was the wrong choice of language. I'm very aware of people whose opinions and expertise are very valuable and I would really like them to be part of keeping TLS 1.3 safe and secure as it lives in the world, but protecting them from internet flame wars. So not too bad, not too bad. It's bad, bad. Yeah, it's closed. So I think we, we uh, we're, as chairs, I think we're taking away a couple things. Um, one, we clearly seem to have dropped the ball with uh, 8773 BIS. We will get together with the authors. I could not find something where I thought we were supposed to be sending a consensus call. So we need to yeah. make sure we're all on the same page there. And we're gonna try to figure out how to uh, change uh, this process a little bit. Uh, a little bit of a mea culpa since we're doing process definition and uh, application on the fly. Yeah. Um, we didn't quite get it right. We are not trying to gum up the works. That's not the plan. We're trying to make sure we can try to figure out how to maintain a relationship with the people who did us a, a solid and uh, did some review. Thank you. Rich, Rich, you're up. Uh, I don't know who wrote the draft. Next slide, please. That was a joke. <laughs> okay, uh, description, uh, ECH keys, encrypted client hello, used to be ESNI, which was a lot easier to say than ech. Um, they're updated regularly and they have to be published to DNS because otherwise clients can't find out how to encrypt the hello to get to you. Um, the concept of this draft is there's a zone factory, uh, Stephen's invention, most of this draft was Stephen's work. Um, it pulls a well-known resource, um, as in dot well-known slash something, uh, to see what the keys are. Um, if they change, it then tests them for validity. Um, it fetches them over HTTPS, so you can trust the authenticity, uh, you know, the server and so on. And then if it's got, a, if the keys are all valid, it publishes it to DNS. Next slide, please. Um, basically, here it is in a picture worth a thousand words. The client looks up AA, double quad A, service B records, DNS, service binding records and so on. Um, uses it to speak to the front end site. It might, the model is there might be a front end that's doing the encrypted client hello, say for example, OSCDN, or it might be the actual origin um, and so on. Uh, they might be one process, they might be 
processes where they re reconnect with the TLS to the back end and so on. But it's the zone factory, the thing on the right hand side, the queries, uh, the site doing the encrypted client hello traffic um, and checks it, verifies it, publishes it to the, 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 the appropriate zone. Next slide. Uh, changes in the, since the last draft, uh, a lot of editorial changes. We upgraded from XML v2 to v3. Uh, we have greater compliance with the service v binding document, um, like there's only one alias entry and things like that. Uh, finished out the IANIC considerations. Um, there is a new registry for the origin service v where you can specify what kind of fields you want. I'll show an example in the next. Um, sorry, the other way around. Uh, a JSON service binding that has JSON entries that you can put in there. Um, security considerations were written. We resolved many issues. They're on the last slide. We'll talk about a couple of them, uh, one in particular. Next. So here's what an example looks like. Uh, the regener regeneration interval, um, well, I forget if it's in minutes or seconds, um, one hour uh, versus, you know, however many, whatever that divides out to. Um, the endpoints is an array of objects. Uh, the priority, so you can have multiple ones that say, well, first go here to this CDN or this front end, or then maybe try that CDN. I know what the priorities that I would use if we were among CDNs, but you may have your own choices. Um, the key thing is the params field. Uh, it's an array of key value pairs, of course, being JSON. Um, ECH, that's the key. Um, the other kind of, end, and you can have multiple endpoints in there. Uh, the well known, the zone factory, checks all of them, picks the ones that, are, that work, and then publishes that to DNS. Um, the other option is you can have an alias pointing to something else, um, and that's this kind of construct where you have multiple things with parameters or a single alias is how the service B document is specifies to go. Next. All right, so these are the issues. Uh, there's the GitHub URL at the top. Um, just going down them in order, in priority order, do we have any IETN issues? I don't think so. It's all just JSON and it's solved all of those problems. So does anyone in here, I mean, there's like a few people maybe that have IDN, uh, I, you know, I whatever the hell that IATN? thing is. I Yeah, it, uh, expertise in this working group to review that. Because this is one of the problems that I foresaw was that we this draft got bounced around a little bit, like go over to, you know, the art area and get some input. Because if there's no one in here that's going to say anything about this, like we need to get some other input from other people. And I did get those early reviews. Yeah, and, right? and don't make me email John Clemson. <laughs> well, that's well, that's the other. There's like three people, right? That, yeah. So okay. I don't see any hands going up. That's I knew. Oh. So I I don't put myself on a queue, but I have IDN experience. I've worked on the protocol with John Clemson and the rest of the folk. I can review that. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Get them later. All right. Um, issued uh, architecture for intermediaries in the modern web, or at least you know more than just a single vanity site. There are often many people, many entities, any one of which might terminate TLS. They're in front of the real origin. Um, we need to figure out probably how to handle that. You have load balancers, different protocols. Uh, you might be taking H3, converting it down, converting it to HTTP 1.0 or something. Is people are known to do. Uh, HTTP gateways, in particular, HTTP gateways are called out in, in the HTTP document, so we need to figure out how to do that. Uh, anyone has any ideas or suggestions, post to the list, open it up on the, on the GitHub, you know, add comments to the GitHub issue. Uh, one origin can claim uh, to speak for others. This is probably underspecified. Martin Thompson did an early review, um, and so of course we'll have to address that. Um, then the final one, and the one maybe we can use some of the time here to discuss is, is this still encrypted client hello specific? Uh, probably not, but that's, I, you know, it, it, I, the only thing that the ECH specific is the name at this point. And so, I, you know, do we want to change the name? Probably not, but um, there was a thread on the mailing list. I don't know how useful this is for other things. Um, it's probably useful for the various, uh, what is it, the bootstrapping service B entries draft. Um, we need to figure out a protection model, probably. Um, who can add what kinds of fields in the params entry? Um, but I just wondered if anybody in the working group had opinions on that last issue. 
Should we work harder to make this more generic and open up, figure out how to address that? Hi, Stephen Farrell. Yeah, I mean, I think getting, getting an answer to this would be the, a good outcome for the staff for this meeting. Um, so I basically, I mean, I think Rich and Ben also share the same opinion that, well, I'm not sure, my opinion anyway, is that it, you know, if, if, if just doing this for ECH makes sense, then we'll go ahead and do that and it should be finished earlier. If other people are interested in using this for other things you might want to publish in Service B records, then it really would be good to know about that now and then talk to them about what they want and try and figure out how to do it. I think I'm going to chair interrupt here. If this is going to be more than about TLS, we're going to kick it out of the working no, group. No, no. Right? That's the, that, I mean, it was yeah. it was brought here on purpose because it was specifically about TLS and where the, where the TLS experts are. If we're suddenly going to be doing something that's much broader and more applicable to the other things, it needs to go elsewhere. Well, I, I haven't heard anybody ask for something that wasn't to do with TLS. The question is, if you're looking, you know, ALPN, is that to do TLS? Okay. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I, 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 oh, there's Ben. And I know David Benjamin has asked this question, so I don't know, is David here? He's in the queue. He's right behind you. He's in oh, the there. queue. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I, I don't really, I know particular, I, if, if there's, we want to do more things with this around TLS, I'm perfectly happy to do that. I'd love that we can decide that soon so that we can kind of progress either keeping it ECH specific or generalizing it somewhat to be also about other TLS things. Yeah, I think David was talking about that key shares would be useful in his draft. And so there's many parameters in TLS that we may want to consider putting in here other than just the one SSL key effect. But yeah, not, not, not going to be the HTTP binding. It's a good thing they're meeting now in another room and can't pollute us. Sorry, uh, Arnav. Yeah, uh, on day, Broadcom. So uh, yes, on the on the point fourteen, yeah, same same point. I think it would be good, perhaps, to make a an exploration about what might come in, uh, just so that you can. I mean, I'm not against. I can understand you want to generalize that could make sense, but you need to perhaps yeah call for uh, for a group to look at uh, what else could happen there, so that you can uh, solidify your. Your model here to abstract it or generalize, generalize it and and maybe we can take it from there just a suggestion sure there are a couple suggestions in 14 as i said i think key share was one of them from david uh, david benjamin wake up David Benjamin, um, I guess folks have said what I meant to say, which is that the key share prediction thing is another place where this would be useful. Um, I sort of expect that like, you know, now that we have this nice new DNS record that we can stuff things into, people will come up with all kinds of interesting ways to use it. And um, whatever the like exact mechanism is, I think since we like, you know, internet practitioners, whether it's HTTP or TLS or whatever working group have like not done much at least, you know, in the sort of space of protocols I'm familiar with, with DNS yet, um, I think having uh, some some clear way for like when your DNS provider and your hosting provider are different folks to like coordinate would be useful. So I guess um, I think yes, there are things in TLS that would benefit from this. I would maybe not put too much weight on the like I sort of understand not wanting the document to like go kind of crazy, um, but you know, if I think at the end of the day we want to find the thing that is like most useful for server operators, and if that does mean we like sort of open the door a little bit that might be worthwhile i don't know anyway i guess it sort of depends on what else people want to do with it ben so i i feel like there's a miscommunication here this draft is already fully generalized it is a complete like the text of the draft no longer has any normative connection to ech or anything related to tls at all but all of the motivations that we've come up with for every use case that we've come up with that motivates the existence of this draft, and there are now maybe four, are all TLS. They all come out of TLS. So this is an interesting situation. This draft can serve any purpose. The only purpose it actually serves is all related to TLS, but its internal structure has nothing to do with TLS. It's entirely between HTTP and, and DNS. So uh, 
I'm not telling anybody where to put this draft, uh, but I think it's useful. It should it should happen somewhere, and we should change the title. So I'm going to disagree with my co-author. Uh, so it, it it does say you should check the ECH keys, uh, and but and I think that is the issue. Like, I I think the structure it defines with JSON and so on that's extensible enough to handle key shares for David's thing. The, 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 the issue becomes thinking thinking through who should kind of have control over those between the uh, you know the front end the zone factory and do we want to write anything about it so yeah I, I, I think the simplest model is the same way the ECH key you verifying the ECH key you have to be able to verify whatever parameters it's got to be the origin transport only that gets affected yeah. right so, so how about, can I make a suggestion? Can I suggest we change the title to something that we can bike share later? And maybe. if and when David's key share thing is ready to suggest a bit of text, he does that. Otherwise, we just proceed ahead with do the ECH stuff. So, it, it, that is a suggestion. I, yeah. have, I have another one. Um, uh, it also may have been that I didn't understand that it was supposed to just be TLS specific. But um, I can do a show of hands to see whether we should, uh, what were the words that I wrote here? So should we expand the scope of dash well-known ESNI uh, to support additional TLS features? Is that an appropriate hum? But then... So it kind of does already is the thing. Okay, fair enough. Like if 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 it's a JSON thing, you, it's extensible. You yeah. can put in the other TLS features if you want. So. It doesn't say you can't. Is the way it does yeah. it. Yeah. I guess the question: Should we wait on that, or should we just go ahead and and if the key share stuff, whenever it's ready, and if it wants to use this, then get text for that then. Yeah, maybe we'll change the title. Change the title? I don't know. It's... Does anybody want to speak against that? That's another way we can do this. Uh, Kyle, I'm not putting you on the spot to speak against or for. Come, come. <laughs> uh, Kyle Eckerts, uh, I do think this is generically a uh, useful document. Um, saying that it is restricted to only TLS things seems like a really arbitrary and strains requirement to me. Like, I can't really think of a good example, but like say you weren't using TLS and you wanted to negotiate like using plain text HTTP or plain text HTTP2 or something like that. Like that's a bad example, but I can certainly imagine things along those lines. Okay, so I mean, if we're getting down to the point of like changing the title and seeing if it, the other stuff comes along in time, great. The question is at what point, how long do you wait? Oh, and Paul's getting up now too, so here we go. <laughs> With a minute left. Paul uh, Valdez, I would just say that if, 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 if this is generically applicable, um, when you do a working group last call on it, please also send it to DNS Ops so they can have a look at well and they, they, they don't get surprised later on. Uh, yeah, so this one's gone through DNS. David Blacka did the uh, thing and he said it was ready with issues and our Opster review and our art, art review said that both said not ready. I meant DNS up, not DNS directorate. Ah, okay, yes. Okay. So I just, I feel like there's still some confusion. I just want to be clear. This is a fully general mechanism that is not in any way restricted to use by TLS in the current draft. But the current draft already supports moving of things that have nothing to do with TLS. And indeed, it has to move things that have nothing to do with, with TLS. It has to move all of the service parameters for the service. But none of the people who defined any of those service parameters wanted this mechanism because they don't change very often. The only service parameters that change often enough to need some kind of automated synchronization are all related to TLS, both the current parameters and the proposed parameters. There's no particular relevance to like waiting for some future TLS related parameters to be uh, defined because the draft is fully future proofed compatible. Any future parameters that are defined for whatever reason will flow through this mechanism uh, just fine. Okay. Yeah, sounds good to me. Well, maybe we'll put an ALPN example in and the, the shared curve. Right, so Rich, just a uh, last question. Um, from an operational perspective, an architecture perspective, so you, you, you see this like we would have a separate component in the architecture that would just do that and would be specialized to just organize all of this? I, I think so, but I'm not, I don't want to think on my feet about the answer to that. I think so. Okay, let's talk offline. Thank you. I mean, it's not going to replace cPanel. But... <laughs> <laughs>
could, could, could come close. All right, don't go anywhere, Rich. <laughs> okay, next. Oh, sorry. There we go. Okay, um, so I hate writing the same thing down more than once. We split up this draft right into one part that went to UTA, one part that stays in TLS. Um, so I looked at all the duplication that was in this draft, because I know how we like to have terse documents. Um, and so if we remove the bullet list from the introduction, I forget what it talked about, uh, remove the consider security considerations because it's not really relevant to choosing 1.2 or 1.3. Um, and then we add a sentence that says nothing here applies to DTLS. Uh, it turns out the draft is about one and a half pages plus boilerplate. Um, and all it does is keep the IANA instructions. Uh, next page. So there's the text. Uh, IANA will stop accepting rec registrations for any of the TLS parameters other than exporters and ALPN. Um, so uh, is there another page? I forget. There's one more. One more. Oh, yeah, post-quantum also. Um, get rid of the, the, we add the sentence to the uh, introduction. It says we're not doing post-quantum, the IETF is not doing post-quantum work for TLS 1.2. Um, as I said, it really makes a document like, you know, 60 lines. Uh, is it still worth doing? I think it does. It sends a message that the IETF is not moving on 1.2 anymore other than uh, critical security fixes. Uh, just like to know if people are fine with that or we should just drop the doc. Chris Patton, can you clarify? I think I missed it. it, yeah. it you want to add this? You want to add this text about TLS? No, this is the text that's left. Oh, this is the text that's left. That's all okay. that's, that, that, this slide and the previous one is pretty much the only thing non boilerplate that's left in the document. I mean, there's some NIST introduction about NIST and IETF, but this is really the text that's left. It's also the most important stuff. Everything else is rationale that really belongs in the UTA document. Hi, yeah, it's John Gray. I was just wondering, so you say no PQ for TLS 1.2. I just wonder if people will do it anyway, or if they see 1. I know lots of people are still 1.2. If they see 1.3 as a bigger hurdle than just adding maybe a new algorithm, they might want to do it in 1.2. In fact, they wouldn't be surprised if people do. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they will. But for example, when we adopt and, and support the chem, ML chem only, document, it's going to have a note in there that says, don't do this in 1.2. Now, yeah. we can't, we're not the protocol police as the phrase goes, but. Yeah, yeah. just just watch out for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a timing question. So we had this um, document, the uh, DTLS RRC, which where we defined functionality for connection ID for uh, DTLS 1.2 and 1.3. Since that has been blocked for a while, and now it's even more blocked with uh, with the previously discussed uh, formal method triage panel and who knows how long that will take. Um, I'm wondering whether now this document uh, uh, will then get published and then I'm not <laughs> basically no. unblocked from uh, yeah, no, doing it, the work that was done beforehand. No, it does say uh, maybe There's, there is a sentence that says none of this applies to DTLS 1.3. Okay. That, that's explicit. Okay. Watson Ladd, Akamai, uh, ship it. I see Chris Patton in the t chat has said similar thing. Yeah. Pavel, just thank you for reopening the queue. Um, does this apply only to RFC required for IANA registrations or also specification requires or like, I don't know if this is a first come first serve because can we really close those in that way? Well. It, it, all of the TLS registries are, are export required. So there are no first come first serve registries in TLS. So our, it's just like new instructions for the DE actually, as it turns yeah. out. So one way or the other, but it's the same, the same plan. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Um, all right. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And Hannes, don't worry, we're not gonna slam the door in your face. We'll, we'll figure out a way to give you an exception.
Yes. <laughs> All right, now, who's next? Uh, Rich SSL Keylog for ECH. All right, time is over. Yes, time is over. Timer, how much time do we give them? Oh, what's going on now? Fire now, cancel timer. All right, go ahead. Um, hello. Um, slide, please. Um, so it's cell key lock is a very useful troubleshooting diagnostic capability used by thousands of engineers uh, worldwide to uh, troubleshoot, uh, diagnose uh, TLS handshake and whatever within TLS. Next slide, please. Um, with ECH, we lose that capability um, because for, for a few reasons, and uh, primarily because we don't we no longer see uh, actual client random. It's uh, within uh, encrypted uh, ECH, and we also don't have ability to troubleshoot ECH itself. And for anybody who is implementing or deploying uh, ECH, it can be excruciatingly sophisticated challenge to overcome. Next slide, please. Uh, so the uh, proposed solution, this is very simple draft. Um, uh, it offers, uh, suggests four things. Uh, so two new labels for SSL keylog, one ECH secret uh, that would log uh, HP, HP key shared secret uh, from which uh, a diagnostic tool can derive all the necessary secrets to uh, decrypt um, ECH and then ECH config label to uh, log, well, ECH config that was actually offered by client or accepted by server. Um, then those messages would come uh, labeled uh, with outer client hello random, and this draft also clarifies that uh, inner client hello random should be used as index for uh, rest of the session as long as ECH was accepted, and this is actually how all the um, uh, TLS stacks that implement ECH today behave with SSL keylog. Um, uh, took the liberty to do a few prototype implementations, just if uh, running code actually matters. Um, it was very easy to implement it in NSS uh, because it happens to carry um, a shared secret from HPK in, in its uh, context. Uh, with boring SSL, it was a little bit more complex because a shared secret is dropped immediately after key sh schedule process, so uh, it took additional callback uh, to implement that. and. Uh, uh, a Wireshark implementation to look into that. Um, so it allows for troubleshooting for diagnostic visibility into ECH so we can uh, see what, what's inside, what was offered by client. Um, uh, it can also check if server has accepted ECH by uh, looking at magic bytes and comparing them to uh, computed ones. Um, and yes, we can then look into the rest of the session because we know if ECH was accepted or not, so which client random should be used and look up uh, keys accordingly. Uh, so uh, the questions that I have, uh, what do you think about this problem? Um, what do you think about proposed solution and should this be potentially adopted by the working group? And if you do get to the microphone and you hated SSH, S, the, SS, the SSL keylog file with a passion and didn't want to get it standardized, please state that before you start making comments. Steven? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever you just said. I mean, yeah. um, so I guess that there's, a, that there's a general question is, for everything we do that improves the security and privacy of TLS, are we also going to specify how to break it as a general question? Uh, more specifically, I guess SSL keylog has been deployed out there. This is kind of a new thing. Are we, are you, I, I would suggest not uh, helping to make this kind of stuff easier. Um, I don't think it's particularly necessary for developers. Um, you could argue about debugging stuff, I guess. And I think there's, possibly a kind of a layering violation in the way you're kind of logging the HPKE shared secret in that if HPKE was Im implemented in some kind of more secure way that you couldn't peek in there, then you couldn't do this. Now, I don't know if anybody who wants to use SSL key logs cares about such implementations, but it wouldn't necessarily work everywhere, I think is the thing. Uh, but yeah, bottom line, I, I just like the other thing, I'm against this thing. <laughs> uh, Kyle. Kyle Nekritz, uh, I think this is a useful debugging tool um, and we should specify how to use it with ECH. Um, I 
my initial reaction is I think this would be a lot easier if we just stuck with the uh, outer client random for the entire connection because it's basically just an identifier. Chris Patton, really cool work. Um, I, this would be like, I think when we were working on ECH, this would have been an amazing thing to have. I really like the fact that you can check that the server accepted. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think if we're doing SSL key log for other things, we should also do it for this. So I'm supportive. Yeah, I disagree with Stephen. Uh, <laughs> um, because this is obviously it's a de debugging tool. Uh, it's not a oh, I'm sitting on the wire and so now I magically can uh, see into the packets. Uh, obviously, that's not what it is. So um, I can't sort of share your your perspective. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. I think the, uh, it's pretty clear we're, we're a little split more towards adopt than not. So we'll take it to the list to try to get uh, consensus on whether or not to adopt the draft. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Where are we going next? Stop in a queue. Who's next? Agenda. Extended key updates. Hannes. Uh, struggling right now. I keep it short. Update? Only have five minutes this time. Yeah. And I spoke about this topic uh, twice already. I uh, got good feedback. First time when I presented it, I was uh, introduced to new requirements, which totally changed the design. Uh, I did. But along the way, I also misunderstood something from the feedback. Uh, so I went off in the wrong direction. That's what I presented in Brisbane. So you made me change it totally again. Uh, so, which is. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm glad that I didn't start with a formal analysis with the first version because that would have been a six months journey. Um, good, so the status is uh, version two. Uh, so here's what we do now. Uh, based on the feedback, we use the Flex, ex Flex extension to negotiate that feature. Um, the feature is the extended key update with forward secrecy. Um, we use a metric exchange to uh, distribute the key shares uh, very much like the initial handshake would be doing as it is exchanging key shares. Um, then there's a separate exchange to then uh, trigger the update of the traffic secrets, uh, which uh, deals with the issue of uh, avoiding any race conditions. And we also added an uh, alert message in case uh, the other beer doesn't want to sort of be bombarded with uh, key updates because there's obviously a computational burden. Uh, the document also talks about how it's forward compatible or forward um, uh, or yeah, forward compatible with some of the work that uh, Deirdre talked earlier today about the hybrid uh, exchange because that now that has uh, been nicely integrated with the key share extension and also with the other work she was presenting about the BQC uh, chem, ML chem uh, that can also be supported. Uh, it's not described in a document or referenced in a document yet because like we just talked about it. Um, but uh, so there's a migration path, which was also one of the requirements that I um, got presented in one of the meetings. Uh, next slide. So this is sort of a screenshot from, from the document. So there's not enough time to go through all the, the details on the slides, but uh, you, you see in, in the red box, um, you see this initial uh, exchange of the key shares uh, followed by the update of the traffic secrets to instantiate those. And yeah, so it uh, should be pretty simple, but uh, next slide. Um, but there's obviously like also referring back to the earlier, meet, uh, earlier presentations in the meeting today, clearly something that we need to do a uh, formal analysis for. And uh, we're working with Osama um, who is also helping Russ, uh, so helping us too, uh, to uh, work on the formal analysis. And, and we had our first meetings already. And uh, we started doing prototyping to see uh, how well that works also with the post-quantum crypto stuff, which we find exciting. Um, yeah, with that, uh, I'm hoping I'm all the way to, uh, uh, to the level of asking you now for uh, adoption of that work to move that into an sort of officially into the working group. And that's it. Uh, 
I think it's extremely important work given that TLS is getting more and more and more wide adoption outside of traditional space within and outside ATF. For example, uh, there is SSH3. Um, uh, no, I don't think it's within ATF yet that is using Quick as a transport and would massively benefit from this because currently is SSH over traditional TCP can rotate key, uh, keys, but over Quick it cannot. Um, so that would certainly help maintain uh, cryptographic properties. And the other use cases uh, are industrial environment and uh, uh, some of the other co-workers have their use cases in the telco space where they replace IPsec-based VPNs with uh, uh, TLS-based ones. Uh, Jonathan Hoyland, Cloudflare. Um, have you had any, have you attempted to implement the TLS flags bit of this yet? Because I had a go at implementing it for um, the REC MTLS uh, draft. And getting the API to be something sensible is, well, it was much more difficult than I anticipated. Um, did, you, did you have the same issue here or is it? Actually, I, I started uh, on the new messages that I showed it. Uh, I didn't assume that uh, things were in, uh, sort of negotiated already. So I'm, I yet have to do that. We'll do that during the summer. So I, uh, I will reach out to you and figure out what the, yeah, because uh, message I can take away from that. Good that you mentioned it. Yeah, yeah. so uh, yeah, definitely reach out because it's surprisingly challenging. Okay, that's uh, I wasn't expecting that. To, I thought it would be a no-brainer, but so did I. <laughs> All right, All right, Dennis. Um, just a, a one one question. So in the draft, there's a bit where the keys uh, need to be deleted and you move to new keys, and it's currently a should rather than a must. And that surprised me slightly in a draft that's about like finding uh, forward secrecy, which is all about when you delete those those keys. Is there a reason why it needs to be a should, or could it be a, a must? Like we we'll have to look at the exact text, uh, but uh, with ephemeral keys, I would assume uh, it's. Or I would claim that they should be deleted asap uh, yeah. and only um, only kept as long as the the duration where you actually obviously need them. Um, so I would say probably a mistake. Okay. I think, yeah, it would be really yeah. nice to tell, particularly for the DTLS case, where yeah. you might have lost messages, to give yeah. a really clear criteria. At this point, you can do it and you must yeah. do it. So the D yeah, uh, yeah, maybe it's a, it's a wording issue that needs to improvement in DTLS case. So there's a, also a DTLS section. So in DTLS case, uh, since the messages are sent uh, unreliably, you need to keep stuff around in case you need to sort yeah. of resubmit them in case you don't get the ACK message. Uh, yeah, but then there can be like a hard cut off at some it would point. Be, it would be yeah. obviously very short period of time. Yeah, yeah. perfect. So, um, so during my chairly duties, are there any objections to running a working group call uh, for adoption on this particular draft? Again, remembering if we adopt it, we can bash it and make it do what we want. All right, I will confirm on list or I'll send a working group adoption call to the list and we'll go from there. Thank you. All right, I don't know who's up here. Who's doing this? Bob, all right, or you're all gonna get up. Okay, cool. I would say feel free to move the microphone, but uh, you're supposed to stay in the pink square, or X. <laughs> um, I guess the other thing I wanna say is that this uh, particular topic has um, been lively on the list, and I wanna make sure that we maintain professionalism at all times, and everybody minds their P's and Q's here. So, thanks. <laughs> All right. Uh, hey, everyone. Um, I'm Devin. This is David and Bob. And uh, we're talking about uh, trust anchor negotiation. Uh, next slide. Oh, sorry. Am I, oh, I got to really hug this thing. Oh, oh, this. I can't multitask. You know this. <laughs> um, OK, so since we last talked about this, I think it was um, Prague last November. Um, there's been quite a few changes. Uh, we didn't uh, present anything in Brisbane, so I wanted to give a quick update. Um, based on some of the uh, initial feedback, we got that the uh, lengthy on-list discussion made it difficult to follow all the points that were made and um, even participate in the discussion. Uh, we were encouraged to uh, summarize a lot of the things that were discussed and analyze it in supporting documentation. So that's what we did. Um, the first thing that we did was we put a, an explainer document out. Uh, this covers trust anchor negotiation at a, at a high level. Uh, and it's a good entry point into this discussion if you haven't looked at it yet. 
the second document that we did uh, is, we, uh, is the PKI transition strategies doc. Uh, this one goes through a bunch of PKI transitions that are relevant to TLS and uh, attempts to analyze how those transitions are impacted by current solutions and how they might be impacted by trust anchor negotiation. Uh, in, in response to some of the feedback we got on the complexity of trust expressions, which it is a lengthy draft, uh, we also submitted another draft uh, with a different approach called trust anchor identifiers. Uh, this sort of inverts the, the flow of this. We'll discuss it in more detail later. Um, and that's uh, dra draft back TLS tr trust anchor IDs. Uh, and so Bob will, Bob will discuss that in a little bit. Um, and then since primarily Brisbane, um, most of the conversation up until maybe a couple weeks ago had been centered around uh, surveillance scenarios, privacy considerations, and security considerations. So where we were able to uh, directly address the technical security considerations um, in the draft, we added uh, these two sections to both uh, trust expressions and trust anchor IDs, uh, as well as um, minor changes throughout to address them. Now, when it came to the surveillance scenarios in particular, uh, because very nuanced differences in a scenario can lead to very drastic outcomes, um, we wanted to be very specific. So apologies for the length of this document um, and how similar some of these use cases are, um, but we want, wanted to be complete rather than uh, skip through some assumptions. So this document, uh, I think actually it's on the second to last slide. Sorry, there's not a link here. Um, the, uh, that document covers these scenarios uh, it attempts to summarize the discussion points raised on list. Um, if we've missed anything, please, please let us know. We want this to be as complete and accurate as possible. Um, and then lastly, we want to talk about maybe some next steps here, uh, given the, the state of affairs. Uh, next slide. All right. So uh, we call this trust anchor negotiation. And what in the world does that mean? So as a brief recap to a problem that I'm sure many of you are all familiar with, uh, TLS has lots of parameter negotiation steps, such as Cypher Suite negotiation. And the problem here is the client implements some set of Cypher Suites, the server implements some other set of Cypher Suites, and our goal is to find a Cypher Suite that they both have in common. Um, and this happens again with curves and basically every other TLS feature. And we do this because we need to support Cypher, Cypher Suite evolution, right? Like different clients, like we, we, we realize some ciphers are bad, we need to remove them, we want to introduce new, more secure ciphers, maybe different implementations have slightly different preferences on whether to prioritize like key size versus forward secrecy in TLS 1.2, thankfully we've sorted that one out, um, or things like this. And so there, we, we have this generic no negotiation mechanism in the protocol to accommodate all of these things, and as a result, the internet can sort of move forward without things being in lockstep. Uh, next slide. So trust anchor negotiation is applying the same thing to trust anchors. Um, the way we use certificates in TLS, the, uh, so we're gonna use the example where the client is authenticating the server certificate just because that's where most of our sort of motivations come from. But uh, it's worth noting that you, TLS has certificates in both directions and sort of the problems and solutions are analogous in each. But for the purpose of this presentation, we're gonna assume the client is the relying party, the server is the, the authenticating entity. Um, so the client wants to talk to example.com, the protocol TLS can only authenticate based on keys, and the server uh, is authoritative for example.com and has some key, and somehow we need to convince the client of this fact. And so we do this by having CAs sign assertions of this. And so in the, in the model that you know, we all use in TLS today, or you know, any certificate-based TLS deployment uses, the client trusts some number of CAs. Um, we often call them trust anchors in 5280. Uh, the server uh, has some certificates available, which attest to uh, its true key and name uh, signed by various CAs. And the trust anchor negotiation problem is simply select a certificate based on what the client trusts. And like with Cypher Suite negotiation, we want to do this because this supports various kinds of PKI evolution strategies. Uh, next slide. So why does this matter? Uh, so we're in Cypher Suite negotiation. We did this because client ecosystems often have variations in Cypher Suites they support. Uh, Client ecosystems in today, in today and TLS are also similarly have slightly diverse trust uh, models, whether they overlap slightly or very little, or sorry, slightly or uh, a lot. Um, so for instance, within the same PKI, such as the web PKI, you often have many root programs and the root programs make independent decisions. Um, often they overlap a little because the goals are very analogous, but uh, ultimately the decisions are independent, they're made at different times and sometimes the decisions are slightly different. Um, within a root program or within like, you know, a, a set of clients with similar decisions, uh, things still diverge over time because the older, when, when 
a client needs to go change some of his trust decisions, uh, the older versions of that client still exist, and those will have the older versions. And so over time, these will diverge. Um, in more extreme cases, some constrained devices, such as IoT devices, uh, may trust only a smaller set of routes because they didn't have the resources to hold them. They may not have the same update processes that the larger clients have, and that adds even more diversity into the ecosystem. Um, further uh, uh, specialized clients like mobile apps might, uh, do, might only care about connecting to one server, and so they might do things like pinning, um, which I think there's an, there's an RFC for that one. Um, and throughout all this, servers need to somehow navigate it. Next slide. And the other point to make here is not only is this the reality of the world, it's actually useful that it's the reality of the world. Because wh so why do old and new clients diverge over time? Well, because PKIs change. And we could solve this by never changing PKIs, but PKI changes are necessary for user security. Um, Sometimes like we uh, trust these root keys that have the keys to the kingdom for the whole of the internet. And some of them are very old. And when you have a key that is very old, it is more likely to have been compromised somehow. And I think we do not need to explain why an attacker with the with owning the root key of a CA can compromise the user. You know, we can build things like transparency mechanisms to try to mitigate this harm, but at the end of the day, transparency mechanisms are an after-the-fact scheme, and so the attacker has still managed to compromise you, it's just that we found out afterwards. Um, so rotating root keys is just an example of a change. Sometimes CAs need to be removed because, you know, they were the older keys or some other trust issues. Um, and over time, we also add new CAs to sort of uh, keep things rolling forward, maybe to like, raise, like, meet a new security bar and so on. Um, and beyond transitions, uh, there are also performance benefits to um, allowing a little bit of wiggle room here. Because if you do not have, if you force everything to use the same certificate, then that certificate has to target the lowest common denominator. You have to send all of the cross signs you need and everything else. Um, but if you are able to uh, tailor the solution slightly, for example, for example, to a newer client or to some other property, then you can have the up-to-date clients trust the short-lived what used to be an intermediate certificate directly. You might avoid unnecessary cross signs when you know the CA is already trusted. You might do some parallel issuance strategies when the cross signs are expensive due to sort of like non-technical reasons why like CAs do not just willy-nilly cross sign each other. Um, and you might imagine even more tailored designs such as the Merkle tree certificates draft we presented a few, a while ago um, that had a sort of bare bones negotiation scheme. And this is sort of uh, the, the, the start of this design was to try to extract that into something more, more, coherent, more, more coherent and sort of self-contained. Um, there's a lot more to say about these sorts of transitions, so uh, I invite you all to read that document. Uh, next slide. All right, so all of this is why the ecosystems vary a lot, but, and, and somehow the servers need to deal with it. So what happens if the servers can't deal with it? Uh, when that happens, we have a conflict between security and availability. On the security side, we need to be able to change the PKI as needed for user, to meet user security needs. But at the same time, the server's goal is to satisfy all of its supported clients. And, so, and you can, as a result, run into conflicts. For example, uh, if one client removes CA1 and supports CA2, then you can say, well, you should just use CA2 or one of the other supported CAs. But the server also needs to support some other clients which only support CA1. This might be because the other clients are older or perhaps some other reason. Um, and some, and if there, there's no more intersection between the two clients, then the server is sort of stuck in a bind. And as a result, we need to sacrifice one of security or availability. If we sacrifice availability, then the servers have to drop support for these older clients. And if we sacrifice uh, security, well, then the PKI changes either do not happen or they take a while while we wait for the entire ecosystem to catch up, and some of which are like constrained IoT devices that will not update. Um, and I think anyone who sort of worked in this space can tell you when there's a conflict between availability and security, it's, secure, it's, it's availability that wins. Uh, and as a result, the casualty of this conflict is user security. Um, and sort of if you think about it, this makes sense because if you, if you imagine the like number of parties involved here, uh, the client is saying, okay, well, I need to make this change to, to make my users secure. And then the server is saying, well, I need to get this working because I need to drop those clients. And so somehow client one needs to tell unrelated server that to just tell the server to drop these unrelated clients. And that's just like not a reasonable conversation to have. Um, if you have negotiation, we have another option. The servers can use both CAs and depending on the client, send the correct one. Um, of course, there's still some cost to this. The server needs to maintain relationships with both CAs. We might be able to automate this in various ways, but ultimately there are two certificates being stored, but this at least gives you a way out of this conflict. Uh, next slide. 
So to recap, the goal of trust angers negotiation is we want to enable servers to handle client diversity so the server availability does not conflict with our PKI goals, security, performance, and so on. Um, and in sort of thinking through this problem and looking at the use cases, we've uh, sort of identified some properties that we want our solution to have. We need to make sure that P the overall goals, the PKI transitions should not impede server availability. Uh, we want, as a result of this, that programs can make timely security decisions on behalf of their users. Um, throughout all this, one thing to keep in mind is that in, in most TLS deployments, there are far more server operators than CAs and root programs. And so where possible, we want to minimize the server operators burden. Um, and so that's why our draft has things like an Acme extension for the CAs to send multiple certificates. That's really orthogonal to our draft, but we sort of put it in there because it's sort of part of this like overall deployment story and in the in service of like reducing server operator burden. Um, and because all of these mechanisms need to ultimately be implemented in the server software, deployed out and rolled out, um, we want to, as much as we can, it's better to have fewer mechanisms that cover the whole problem rather than a bunch of independent mechanisms that cover pieces of the problem, might not cover all of them, and now we need to like decide how these all combine, we need to handle the client servers that only support half of them, we might need to do several rounds of updates, and so um, if we can sort of capture the problem in a crisp way, like we've already done with Cypher Suites and other TLS parameter negotiation, things get a lot tidier. Um, and of course, as we transition to PQC with the horrific giant signatures, we really want to minimize bytes on the wire. Um, and this is all covered in a bit more detail in the explainer. Um, next slide. And then I'll hand it over to Bob to talk about the... Don't die. Don't die, we like you. Um, <laughs> we have, oh, I have to stand in the box. Yeah. I, I'm a walkie talker, so staple my feet to the floor. Uh, we do have two approaches here. Uh, we brought in another one to make a very much simpler version of what we still want to achieve. So starting up front, there is a way already in TLS to do certificate negotiation, to ask the server what you, for what you want. It's called certificate authorities. The biggest problem is what it sends is just too large. It's sending a subject, it's 100 bytes on average, and some PKIs have many uh, CIs, possibly hundreds. So there's two approaches. Trust expressions, we've already presented mostly in Brisbane. It's been out there. Trust anchor IDs is recent. Next slide. Just to recap trust expressions, uh, the clients in trust expressions express a CA list as effectively a name with deltas. Um, they're pre-provisioned with this. Uh, this is knowledge they get from their root program, uh, and that's maintained with the CA. The server receives trust anchors, tr server receives certificate chains uh, from their CA with metadata added on to know which trust expressions to match. Most of the complexity here is between the root program and the CA, and that's why the document's very long. But in the end, this is a TLS extension to ask for a trust anchor via a name and to match one via a name between the client and the server. Uh, most of the end, so next slide. Trust anchor IDs uh, are a way to basically, let's take certificate authorities and change it to be more useful. The first problem is the names are too large. The solution's pretty simple. We just make shorter names. Um, we allocate via any mutually agreeable mechanism between clients and servers uh, an OID for each CA. So for each trust anchor, we just allocate uh, an OID under a relative, under a private enterprise number. If you do it, Sanely should be about five bytes per CA, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, depending on the actual number allocated. You configure the server with, uh, the server will get these identifiers by the certificate property list, the same way we have outlined this happening with trust expressions. And the client just gets configured to know the trust anchor IDs for each of the trust anchors that it trusts from its root program. So we define a new trust anchors TLS extension that looks more or less just like certificate authorities, but carries trust anchor IDs instead of the full subject. Next slide. Uh, the difference here is that we do end up in most situations being server offer and client select. We don't want to send the full trust anchor list, or we want to not require you to send the full trust anchor list. Uh, there might be client bandwidth, or there might be privacy concerns about exposing everything the client actually trusts. Um, instead, we use a retry in the same style as encrypted client hello after the server can offer its full list of trust anchors. So the client may send an empty extension or a subset if it wants to make a guess at what the server might have. 
Um, no matter what happens, the server decides to then send its entire list of trust anchors that it has in the encrypted extensions message and handshake. At that point, if the client looks at what it gets back from the server and it can't use it, or if the server hangs up with an error, the client may then take what was in the encrypted extensions, look at this, say, I want this one, and make another connection requesting something the server actually has, hoping for a match on the retry. Uh, one of the things that we don't like about this is that you actually have to implement a retry mechanism. Uh, it's possible to consider work to possibly do this retry flow within the handshake, but we've not done this in this draft right now. That would be something to possibly bash around with the working group if we wanted to consider it. Next slide. Uh, however, to avoid the retry latency entirely, back to the will this just be used for uh, <laughs> Sorry, Rich. Um, the retry flow that adds latency. So instead, we could list the available list of trust anchor identifiers in the DNS by an HTTPS service B record. Uh, the clients would look this up uh, for an additional prediction in a trust anchors extension. Uh, at this point, the DNS could be stale. The DNS could have the wrong information in it compared to what the server actually has. So at that point, you would only use the retry flow to repair mispredictions when the client gets the wrong answer from the DNS, picks incorrectly, and you have to retry with authoritative information from the server itself. And this obviously has a server operator challenge to keep the DNS and the TLS configuration in sync. Um, hopefully we could use the methods uh, already in draft by this working group to solve that problem. Next slide. So here's the side-by-side -side comparison with trust expressions and trust anchor identifiers. Um, one of them only expresses root program trust stores. Trust anchor ID supports arbitrary CLA lists. It's usable by anybody without having to define a root program, if you will, relationship. Trust expressions is analog, it works for both client and server certificate negotiations. Um, with trust anchor IDs, the retry flow is really only possible with server certificates. Uh, because of the way TLS works today. Um, for deployment mechanisms, uh, servers use just static configurations from CAs and trust expressions, nothing really changes. Um, but servers need to synchronize TLS and the DNS for the best performance and trust anchor IDs. And root programs coordinate with manifests or root programs just have a static manifest where they just I put an identifier on each of their, their trust anchors. Um, privacy concerns are sort of a flip of each other. The client CA list is passively observable in trust, anchor, trust expressions, assuming the trust expression is publicly known. You know what trust anchor set this client is using with trust expressions. Uh, it's not in trust anchor IDs. You actually have to actively probe it. Um, the server's list of certificates would have to be actively probed with trust expressions Whereas presumably if the server is putting its trust anchor list in the DNS, uh, it's very publicly visible in the case of trust anchor IDs. The interesting thing is, is both of these mechanisms can exist together and they could be used uh, in conjunction with certificate authorities. So you could have one or the other or both or all three. Um, next slide. Um, okay, so uh, circling back to um, the security considerations uh, that we discussed earlier, um, as I mentioned, we've updated the drafts where um, specific technical points were made uh, and these were addressable. Um, things like speculation on how policymakers make decisions in light of this um, don't really fit super well in, in the draft text itself. So we've um, written a supporting document on top of that. Uh, I, I will say that uh, not that number of words is an indicator of quality in any matter whatsoever, but the supporting documentation now is nearing around 13,000 words. Yeah. Uh, so we are doing our best to be holistic and comprehensive in responding to these things. And I will once again say if there's any analysis here that's incorrect or incomplete, please let us know. Our goal is complete and accurate analysis. Um, <clears throat> And uh, next slide, please. 
so uh, to, to wrap things up, um, we have to, we've proposed two approaches here um, to solve trust anchor negotiation, uh, understanding that these are pretty weighty drafts given some of the non-TLS complexities involved. If you've read them, thank you. Um, we, we truly appreciate that. Uh, we, uh, our primary purpose of talking here today is that we're looking for feedback from the working group on preferred approach. We've put forth two different ways of solving this problem. Uh, and uh, we are always welcome for feedback on, uh, uh, on list or GitHub. Uh, GitHub issues are actually very easy to track and uh, address directly. And finally, uh, we wanna sort of open things up for discussion. Um, we would like to take the temperature for just general preferred approach uh, in the realm of trust anchor negotiation in TLS. Uh, and based on that, um, sort of feed his input to our call for adoption strategy down the road. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Let's uh, keep it professional, right? <laughs> fine, fine. <laughs> In, uh, in Ike v2, uh, actually in Ike v1, we also had this problem of certificates being too big. And there, years ago, um, and we, actually it's worse because we were stuck to a UDP packet. Um, and there we actually cho chose to do just a hash of the CA. Um, and then if you really only want five bytes, you can hash this hash it and just truncate it to five bytes. Um, I don't know why you would go the indirect way of getting OIDs and going into dead roots to, to get a unique identifier. Uh, the uh, decision to go to, to OIDs uh, was something that um, was just a first attempt at truncation. Uh, to, to be clear, we were just trying to shrink this down to size. Uh, it's something that is uh, assignable. Uh, it's also managing uh, the authority. And when it comes to trust anchors, there are multiple different, like the hash will differ based on nuances within the certificate itself. And so this could be something that could be tracked commonly, commonly with a, sort of a central uh, Unmanaged, un, not managed by us authority, um, but we're open to other suggestions in this space if it's uh, if it's better. All right, so just a time check. We got ten minutes, and we got I don't know eight eight nine people in the queue. So keep it really quick. Thanks, Alessandro Gadini, Cloudflare. So uh, my sort of gut preference would be for the trust anchor IDs. Um, you know, just put stuff in DNS, and what could possibly go wrong. Um, <laughs> But there, I, I have a couple of, of questions for you. So you say that you know for trust expressions, um, most of the complexity is between the root program and the CA, which I guess works fine if you already have a, a, a root program already. Um, but say you know maybe I am a mobile app and I want to do some key pinning. Um, I guess that would require me to have those relationship with the CAs. Is that or at, at, because I, I would need to sort of communicate some kind of trust or ID that the CA would then communicate to the to the server or the subscriber. So, so the question is, if you have only like one or two CAs because you're doing like a pinning thing. Yeah. Um, so, so you're right. The like trust expressions does not handle that one as well. Uh, that's part of why they sort of coexist. So you could. If the CAs, if you were okay sending, you know, two 100 byte names, you could just use the existing certificate authorities extension, um, or you know, we could do a bit of both and do the other one. So, because like when you when you only have to when you only have like a few, it's sort of the problem's easy. You're just trying to list a couple of them and move on with life. Um, it's the trust expressions and the sort of complexities around having to invert the selection come from there being like. You know, yeah, I, I guess similar question for like client certificates i guess we we do already do you know the certificate authorities extension for that it's slightly annoying because there could actually be you know a few of them and those bytes could still add up um but yeah. sure yeah so trust anchor id is for the non-inverted case works just fine for client mm -hmm. certs as well so you could define the shorter names and you know right get, yeah uh, it, yeah i see that as a sort of optimization for the existing extension right so so that again would be my preference chris Patton, with my um security of transport at the the layer of the transport hat on um question for bob is the um, retry mechanism significantly different from what we have for ECH today? I don't believe so. So I think, uh, I know NSS, Boring SSL, and a few, maybe a couple of other stacks, probably Russell's by now, probably has this already. So I'm wondering how much of a lift that would be for people. A, a full retry 
in, in an application where you have to open a new connection that's beyond the scope of the TLS set to act yes. as it currently sits, which is one of the issues. Yes, yes. But we have the same issue for ECH. Um, so with that said, um, I would I I have a slight preference. I think Anchor IDs is heading in a better direction. So that's with that trust Anchor IDs is good even with the retry. I think it, yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Ben Schwartz, how do you imagine this handling horrible enterprise TLS interception scenarios? Uh, and also like less horrible Charles proxy, like debugging TLS interception scenarios. Uh, sorry, could you, um, when you say the horrible TLS interception scenarios, uh, are, is this in the case where a client trusts a misbehaving CA or there's a misissued certificate involved? No, this, no, or? I'm talking about the, the case where the client has been configured with an additional CA that's only used locally and is outside of any root program. So uh, without making comments as to the desirability of such configurations, um, in that kind of environment where you configured the client to trust a like terminating proxy, there is only one CA. And so this, the, the server, quote unquote server, the terminating proxy, just always sent you that certificate. So it didn't really matter. Um, so like it doesn't interact in that like they didn't have this problem to solve in the first place. I, I know the, the the question is just what am I supposed to, what does the client send? Oh okay so you're asking whether the client like what which CAs the client will send? Yes um, so that the that that's discussed in the privacy consideration section of the two drafts but broadly uh, if you send the thing you have sent the thing so you should only so you you don't have to have all of your roots participate in these designs you can choose to omit some of them and so in the trust expressions model we were envisioning that you would sort of send you know the the built-in ones in your browser or something analogous for whatever your other client is and you wouldn't send the user added ones because at least without some clear signal from someone authoritative who owns the device like that's uh that's a privacy leak um, okay, does so that require ID? some kind of new interface between the operating system and the browser to understand which of these C, which of the operating system CAs are like global part of a root so, program and which are like weird local so, ones? So this depends on uh, exactly what the like, like, like this, this is somewhat operating system specific on some systems. So uh, I guess I can speak to what Chrome did. Uh, Chrome used to use the operating system list and then switch to using its own. When Chrome switched to using its own, of course, like, it's very obvious which one came from Chrome and which one came elsewhere. Um, when we use the operating system one, uh, there were various way APIs to tell the difference. They were, some of them were more janky and some of them were less janky. So uh, depending, so I guess in the case of trust expressions, it was already necessary that the operating system provide you this like trust expression information. And so if it's already able to do this, presumably it's also, we can we can like use that same time to extend it with whatever is needed, um, but broadly it was already kind of possible. Um, but you know, in general, we do assume that the clients know something about what they trust and can make decisions accordingly. Thank you. Um, so and just, I should add that on the trust anchor ID side, the sort of decision is less stressful because it requires active probing. Though we might still like, like you can still imagine the client like filtering down. So, so just to make sure we get some input back from the working group, if this is a big if, if we were to do this, which one would you prefer? Yes, would be the trust expressions, and no would be the trust anchor IDs. We can keep doing this, but Kyle, go ahead. We're definitely running out of time though. Uh, yeah, Kyle Nakritz. Um, so first, I want to second the point about um, the uh, availability taking preference over security in these cases. Uh, the other way around that is to deploy a um, really unfortunate mechanism of negotiation, like client hello fingerprinting, where we take a non-exact signal. Um, if we say we're not going to do anything in the space, I think it's inevitable that that's what's going to happen. So I think it's very important that we do something here. Uh, on these two drafts, I think I have a slight preference uh, to the trust anchor IDs, although I'm quite concerned about the uh, retry mechanism, um, but I won't go into the details due to time. Watson? Watson, uh, I really think we need an interim or something to talk through these issues. There's a bunch of complexities we haven't even touched on for stuff like command line programs using Debian's roots, which are copied out of Mozilla's, but you don't know anything about the capabilities. I just think we need a lot. There's a lot of details here we don't have time to talk about now. So I, th I think right now we're just trying to uh, get a general sense of which way to go. And I think it's definitely trending towards the trust anchor IDs. That definitely gets us going. If we want to have an interim or something else, I think we'd want to make sure we get the documents edited first, but thanks. Andrew? 
Andrew Chen, uh, trust expressions makes a lot more sense to me. Uh, it seems to, it's very parallel to the world where as a server, you're trying to probe a client, try to figure out what it supports just by like doing J3 fingerprinting type of thing. This just makes the whole thing a lot more explicit. So, so the client can tell the server exactly what CAs I support and then I can, as a server can pick really easily. Um, the retry aspect of the anchor IDs worries me. It makes uh, setting up a TLS connection somewhat unpredictable as to how long it will take. And if you're doing things that are latency sensitive, that it seems like I would avoid actively avoid anchor IDs to avoid that kind of non-deterministic connection time. All right, at the close, Farrell, you get the last word. Oh, well, let's not do it. Uh, uh, <laughs> I knew that. Uh, so I interpreted a no opinion there as meaning don't like either of the above. Um, I think before, I think it was raised on the list by Tim, before doing this kind of stuff, I think we should think through what we think the dynam the long-term dynamics of interaction between the TLS protocol uses and the root programs and PKI should be. Uh, I think uh, for various reasons, we should do that first, I think, before we think about uh, whether to address this, and if so, whether to base a starting point on either of these approaches. So that's why it's a big capital F there at the beginning. So, yeah. All right. Um, thank you. That is it. Thank you for attending the TLS session. We will be in touch. Russ, if you're still in the room, we'd like to talk to you. Well, there was a show of hands. And just to be clear that for the minutes, that in terms of picking whether it was trust expressions or trust anchor IDs, that it was 24 in favor of trust anchor IDs and six in favor of trust expressions and 12 no opinions. I don't think Russ is here. I think he left.